Good afternoon, Tim. Hello, Anthony. Nice to meet you, sir. Yeah. Well, we've been communicating in social media for quite some time. So. Yes, we have. You've yeah. been uh, quite a pleasant uh, comrade to have in in the social media circle. And well, I try to be interesting. I don't know if that's, <laughs> if that's, if that's well. Thing. You're human. You're human, right? I like, try to be. But yeah. yeah. But I, yeah, I, I veer in and out of my lane, apparently, according to my critics. But that's <laughs> well, like I briefly said to you, I've been a fan since Just it, for Laughs, it, it, Comedy it, Now. Uh, you know, oh, even that far back. Oh, even good. that far back. Yeah. yeah, Comedy Now when you had the whole one-hour segment. Yeah, the 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 camping material was yes, the, the big yes. stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, all my kid jokes before I had kids, <laughs> when they were hypothetical, when they were <laughs> mythical. And now you have them, so the jokes have changed. They've been all yeah. Different. Well, uh, yeah, we didn't do any of the name stuff. Like they have, they have regular names. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, what most, you mean. Mostly because I gave the the my wife the the person that actually bore them the veto power. I did that too with mine. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I'll make suggestions, and and you pick from the ones, that, and and even then, you you did the hard work. So yeah, when you see her lying there doing all that hard work, it's like, hey, you go ahead, you. Yeah, you name get them whatever say. you want. Like, <laughs> <laughs> with now, with our last name, you got to be a little careful. You know, anything that starts with a P, uh, you can't have. You know, you got to. Uh, my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's name was Iona, which I yeah. think is a very pretty name. But you can't I have an too. Iona. You, yeah, you can't have an Iona nut. So that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't just doesn't ring right. Yeah. No. I was it, again. Weirdly enough, uh, growing up with this last name, I grew up amongst. Uh, my dad came from a giant Irish Catholic family, so I have. I, I, I do it in my act sometimes, but uh, I have fifty six first cousins on one side. What? Yeah, like my dad was one of uh, of eleven that survived. Wow. And my grandmother uh, had, I think, six or eight mar miscarriages. I, one day, uh, uh, one of my cousins and I sat down and figured out that my grandmother was effectively pregnant for 24 years straight. Oh, my God. Yeah. And she oh, wasn't man. a very pleasant person. And it was and this was after she died. And and me and my cousin sat around and for we were having a couple of beers. Uh, it was a, he was at a, after a show that I was doing. And we just all just kind of we just did the math and went, oh, my goodness, of course, she was an awful, miserable human being. She was pregnant for 24 years. <laughs> like, like I, I don't know how many kids you have, but I, I did the pregnancy thing with my wife twice and went straight to the vet to get the vasectomy. <laughs> like, we're done. We're not do, no way. In hell. If we maybe we'll adopt, maybe we'll foster but there's no way I'm I'm living with you pregnant again for another nine months. So yeah. <laughs> it was it's torturous. There's some women that glow and there's some women that appreciate it. And uh, I did not marry one of them. So <laughs> careful, she might be in the other room. Oh, she knows. <laughs> We've <laughs> had this conversation. <laughs> Who do you think drove me to get my vasectomy? <laughs> 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 no, Fast you're going. You're going and you're going now. That was faster than an ambulance. Yeah. Pretty much. So, I'm sure you've been asked this, but I haven't heard the response. Okay. What was your inspiration into getting into comedy? Were you always the class clown? Always like no, joke around? I was not the class clown. Uh, uh, it's um, I'd always been uh, I'd been a, I was a theater guy. Uh, oh, okay. I had this weird dual personality when I was uh, in, in sort of between middle school and high school. Uh, where I played rugby and football and, and was athletic and skied and did all this stuff. And I kind of hung with that group a little bit, but I was always uh, interested. I was cast in a cast play when I was like in grade six and uh, got a bit of a theater bug. So I always gravitated towards doing um, uh, like plays and, and, and theater. Right. And uh, when I ultimately went to university, that's what I studied. I studied performance theater and creative writing. And I kind of had an idea that I wanted to be a playwright. And as I went through that process of uh, being in, in plays and, and directing and, and performing, uh, it 
became fairly clear after a bit that I didn't play nice with others. <laughs> that I didn't, the, 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 the collaboration was the part that bothered me. I didn't enjoy having to defer to a director. I didn't enjoy deferring to a writer. Um, when I wrote stuff and had other people perform or um, or direct it, it bothered me that they were doing it wrong. <laughs> I know it sounds really arrogant, but it, it turned out that, um, and then I, when I left university, I was actually studying to be a, a chef. Oh, okay. I'd kind of given, I'd gotten such a bad taste in my mouth from, from working with theater people um, and then no offense to theater people. It's, it was, it's my bag to carry. It's, it was me. That was the problem. hundred percent. Now you're stuck on a stage by yourself. Yeah. Well, here's <laughs> the thing. Uh, I, I fell down a flight of stairs and I, and I, oh. I hurt my back really badly. I fractured two vertebrae oh, and my. was on workers' compensation for about 10 months. Uh, this was in, in like 93. Uh, I was living in Vancouver and a friend of mine, uh, signed, I, I'd always been sort of the, I was never the class clown, but I was always that guy at the kitchen party that was, had something to say right? about whatever, like, you know, I, I could tease or whatever, just was tried to be the life of the party a little bit. Right. Um, and she just said, you should do stand up. And I'm like, what a ridiculous thing to do with your life. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, when, when Yuck Yucks was still at the Plaza of Nations downtown in Vancouver there. Uh, she signed me up for an amateur night and said, you have two weeks. You're going on. It was uh, May the 5th. Um, and uh, I went. I knew I'd never hear the end of it if I didn't. <laughs> and the reality is it went OK. It didn't go great. It didn't go bad. Um, it, it was a positive enough experience for me to give it another couple tries. And uh, in that next couple of tries, this is right about the same time that I, that I hurt my back really badly. Right. And I had, I had the opportunity to go to every open mic to go to all, there was three clubs in Vancouver at the time. There was punchlines, laugh lines in New West and the yuck yucks. And it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday were their pro-am nights. So I just kept going. And as I picked up some steam, I took any, um, any gig I could get anywhere I could get. Cause I, I, after about a month, I could stand and move, but I couldn't lift or, or bend or do anything physical. And I was still, um, doing my treatment and my physiotherapy for the back. Uh, but I could go and hold the microphone. And in that sort of nine to 10 months, I, 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 I got to spend, I was probably doing five or six shows a week oh, wow. and just hitting it as hard as I can, as often as I can, because I was, I had the luxury because I was getting a paycheck from workers comp. Right. So I, you know, you want to go to do a show in Kamloops for 50 bucks? Sure. You want to go to Prince George and get booed off the stage? You bet. Like <laughs> whatever it was, I just, I just went and did it. And it, it, it I, I, and in that point, I mean, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a great Canadian comedian, uh, Mike Wilmot, um, but he, he, he has a, a said something to me very early in, which was, this isn't a, this isn't a job. This is a calling. Oh, and, okay. and if you feel that calling, I have to do that. Like most standups, I think if they could quit, they would, All but right. if there's something that's incredibly compelling about the, um, the art of this particular, this, this particular performance art. Uh, people who get it, people who uh, get the bug, um, just we, it, it's hard to walk away from it. it it's a, I believe it's a form of addiction. So, right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's certainly, uh, it's healthy. I think it explains why there's so many addicts in this industry. Um, I, I don't know if I know a single person uh, who's not addicted to something, cigarettes, liquor, drugs, exercise like whatever it is people use to fill up these weird holes in their soul right um there seems to be a, a an almost a hundred percent uptake of it and i honestly believe what they're actually addicted to is the joy and the rush of doing comedy when it works it's a hell of a, it's a hell of a feeling when it's when you get that wonderful response from a crowd over something that you created and to, and to circle all the way back as a stand-up, I got to wrote to write my own material. I got to perform my own material, and I am the producer and the director nice. in those moments. 
Right. And I get all the credit and I get all the blame and I'm really okay with that part of it. <laughs> so that's the, the, so I was not the class clown. <laughs> But how does it feel to go from those small little clubs and then you're on you're on stage at Just for Laughs in Montreal? Yeah. It's so receptive to just about everybody that walks out on that stage. How does that feel to get out there? You're all by yourself. It's just you and the mic and the crowd. How's that feel? Like when you first went out there, how was it nerve wracking or you just well, kind of uh, go with it? This is this might be a little homework assignment, but if you, if they go on YouTube yeah, um, the it's it's on there. The my 2006 just for laughs, uh, and it's where I talked about the peanut allergies, right. and where I talked about the street hockey. Oh, um, yeah. and at the, at the very beginning, there's a little the segment of me going talking about, oh, it's fun to be here, and uh, they did a little B-roll footage, and that camera crew followed me around. We did something really fun. We took a little piece of uh, astroturf. And I had my golf clubs with me and we played urban golf where we, we <laughs> took the AstroTurf in front of churches and putted into potholes. Oh, uh, it, it didn't actually make the cut, but we knocked about 20 like range balls into the St. Lawrence. I just wanted to see, if, you know, of course I can't hit it over the St. Lawrence, but I just wanted, to, it was just kind of something fun to do, but apparently it's, it's littering. I think the statute of <laughs> limitations oh. is out, but you're not actually allowed to hit golf balls into the river. Um, so they didn't want to show that on TV. Uh, but this crew was with me all the way through the first couple of days that I was at Just for Laughs. And I remember the that particular taping was with the Craig Ferguson gallery on the gala on the Wednesday. And as I, I was thinking I was on third or fourth, as I was going, like as the other comedians on the show were going, this little French Canadian dude that was doing the B-roll just kept going. Like, are you nervous? Are you are you freaked out? This is a big deal. Like, are you freaking out? And I've been doing stand up for about thirteen years at this point. Because yeah, right. so I I kind of gotten my road salt and 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 figured this out. But he just kept winding me up and winding me up, and I wasn't really nervous until he. And then if if you watch the the reason I want people to watch the footage is because you'll never see it again. <laughs> As I come through the gate, the, the the entrance to the theater, to the stage, yeah, I've got this weird sort of hippity hoppity, hey, what's going on, gate? Like I'm moving a little faster than than I've got sort of like a spring in my step. Right. What happened was is there was a sandbag that I couldn't see because there it's pitch black behind those sets. As I was walking after I heard my name. I tripped over that sandbag and I'm going ass over tea kettle and somehow sped up my legs to make the corner with this sort of jaunty, hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Never before or since have I done this. But in that exact moment, it was like I didn't fall on my face on national television at my first Just for Laughs gala. Oh, my God. These are people. And I tell jokes to people for a living. I've been doing this for 13, like, and I, and, and before you do it just for last set, you re rehearse that seven or eight minutes for months in that order, because you send it in and they vet it and they make sure that it's good for time. I, I don't know my own postal code, but I know that joke word for word for the rest of my days. Right. So it, I had this weird moment of like, oh, I didn't just embarrass myself. And then, of course, the first joke hit, and it just just exploded. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I've never really felt. I, my children think I'm a I'm a I'm a mutant because uh, I I've never really had any sort of pronounced stage fright. Like it, it's never bothered me to be on stage. It bothered me if I didn't know my lines that well. It bothered right. me if I would. But it was never like, oh, my God, like I never had a problem being on stage. Like it's like I feel like it's like a mineral deficiency like because it, it doesn't make any sense. You should be afraid. You should not have that. You know, th these are people that could harm you in some fashion if you say something wrong. But it's never, never bothered me. And I was lucky enough that I was prepared when these big opportunities came that I'd done the work I did. I'd done the, the muscle memory. I'd done that 10,000 hours of becoming an expert Right. where uh, 
it's kind of like jumping out of a plane. You don't know if you can do it until you do it. And then once you do it, you're like, ah, it wasn't so bad. Right. Like when I do comedy workshops every once in a while, um, I, I actually encourage them to lean. There's going to be a moment somewhere in their, in their open mic careers where it's going to go sideways. It's going to go pear shaped as hell. So lean into it, go as bomb as hard. If you've, if you're already bombing, go down, cut the engines, point the plane at the ground and just pound just it, in, bomb. pound it straight into the dirt. Um, and then you'll know what that feels like. And then you'll know that's as bad as it's ever going to get. Right. So if you if, when you stop being afraid of bombing, you have no problem bombing. But it also one of the one of the things about it is, is that it also creates a, an environment where you can take risks without and, and where we grow is when we take those risks. When we expand, we go outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, because I don't know how often you get out to open mics or amateur comedy shows, but you'll see there's a there's a group of people that that that, that populate these venues where they get a seven minute set that will work. And they don't. They get they get married to it. They they, they it becomes a security blanket. And, and as right. soon as they start having a rough go, they'll try a new joke and it won't go well. They'll go straight back to old faithfuls. And they very rarely make any progress. And they very rarely get past that level because it becomes you. you, you there, fear is a good thing, but f- you should embrace the fear that propels you forward, not the fear that holds you back. If that makes right. any sense. Yeah, no, yeah. it does totally. Yeah, so that's my so yeah. So when 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 big shows come around like that, uh, I get excited, but I don't ever get like, oh my god! Like I did the 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 grandstand shows at the Calgary Stampede a couple years back. Oh, okay. And that was bananas. That was <laughs> twenty thousand people. Oh wow! And I had to go on right after. Uh, there was a, a a dance troupe. The the in Calgary the they have the uh, young Canadians that put on the big show at the grandstand, okay. but there's like 150 teenage girls dancing to Pat Benatar, while a group of Guatemalans are riding their dirt bikes around the inside of a giant globe. Oh yeah, to like I said, Pat Breaker, Pat Benatar's heartbreaker, as a stunt team is jumping their motorcycles over the whole damn thing oh my god so right after that they bring all the lights down put a single spotlight <laughs> it's like we have a comedian You're <laughs> it's just me Twenty thousand people and it was and, and part of it is you find a couple of people and like, i can't see there's so much lights and, and circumstance right. uh i find a, almost like a comedy club size group in the middle on the on, on the, in the standing room there and i start telling jokes to people Right. And that's, and, and essentially that's the thing. Like uh, I've done shows for four people. I've done shows for 25,000 people. Right. The most, the, the one common denominator is people. Right. And one of the, the things about uh, for me, because I'm a storyteller, uh, I just tell my story to those people. And if they're, if they're feeling it, then that's awesome. If they're not, I go, I have other stories. Let's move on to a different topic. If this one's not good going to work for you or if you don't get that response that you're looking for you might move on to somebody else sort of uh, I, I, you just kind of you, you play where it lies like i think there's a, a good analog between golf and uh and and stand-up comedy like it's you know the the turn of the century golfer walter hagen had a had a kind of a uh, a philosophical outlook to golf that i've kind of applied to stand up which is three bad shots and one good one is a par <laughs> if you can hit it into the rhubarb if you know how to hit it out back onto the fairway right. and, and then and then but like the taking the risk thing if you know that you can make that shot you're not worried if your ball goes over there it's not the end of the world it doesn't ruin your whole day right and uh there's a zen ish quality to um it, 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 it sounds bizarre as hell but when you, as, as, a, as a performer, if you stop worrying about the outcome and you worry about the process and the quality of the joke or the song or the whatever you're doing, then the people that it will inspire or, or the people that will enjoy it 
will find it. And the people that don't, you just go, I'm sorry, I thought that was good. And I, if you don't like that one, I'll just do another one. Right. Like, you know, it's like a Chinese buffet. You don't like shrimp? Well, there's chicken over here. Let's go right. see if we can get you some chicken. And, you, and, and again, now all of this is based on, like, you never do it on purpose. You never go, I'm going to see if I can upset these people. On, but when, when you stop having a, an overwhelming, um, when you become overly concerned about the outcome and not the process, it seems to be where this falls apart for people. Right. You know, you'll go watch an amateur comedian and they'll they'll tell a joke and the, the, the response will be tepid or not good. And they'll, they'll actually start the next joke with, here's another one you won't like. <laughs> it was like, well, you just gave me permission to not like it. So, OK, right. <laughs> seems fair. You don't even have believe in it. Why should I? Um, right. yeah. so it comes, you're setting, yeah, you're setting yourself up for failure, well, absolutely. And and you, but you're it's 100 percent is because I, I was, I have a daughter in university right now, and she's struggling a little bit with just finding getting her feet under her with the it's just your very first year, right? And I, I say, honey, it's not about you, don't you don't need to get 100 percent on every test, you're not failing what you you're identifying places where you need to work and where, where you need to learn. And if, and if ultimately you understand how to move through university properly and you only get B's this semester, or even God forbid C's, you will have laid the groundwork for next semester and the next couple of years to be even better. Right. Because you're, because it's not the outcome, it's the process. And that's, and I honestly believe that that's, probably the most important thing about doing uh any kind of artistic in endeavor i don't expect your student film to win an academy award but i expect you to learn what you need to do to make a better film right right and then ne your next attempt should be better what how can you build upon what you've already done and it doesn't always work and if you can forgive yourself and go okay let me try that it works it, it generally i think it, the outcome will ultimately be what you need yeah from that but we don't do i don't do any of this for the for the accolades or the awards i've won awards and i've been best of the fast or whatever and again i'm more interested in the the people that that had a good time at the show than somebody patting me on the back for doing it right so you're not they're, looking for accolades. You're just looking for people that are going to show up at your shows, right? They're, they're, I, you know, I never turned one down. <laughs> uh, but it's, but it's again. I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's about, um, it's a side effect of doing good work. And if your, if your commitment is to being, you know, I, I read something years ago. It says, "Don't learn the tricks of the trade. Learn the trade." Oh. Right? If you learn your process, you know, if you're if you're a musician, you learn your scales and your notes and it's boring as hell. But when you understand how they're all they all go together and you can move past your you know, like when you're learning to play a guitar, how to play your fingers, build up your calluses. Once you've done that groundwork, your freedom of expression can go anywhere it needs wants to be. Right. But if you never put in that groundwork you're you've you've hobbled yourself you've, you've you've put yourself in a position where you can't move past your limitations and we all have a, we all have limitations on some level i'm never i play guitar but i'm never going to be joe satriani or eddie van halen because honestly i don't have 16 hours a day to to do that their 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 raw talent and their and their commitment and their passion and their i think it's fair to say obsession mm -hmm propelled them into something but it was it, again they did the work they put yeah. the process in they deserve the the accolades that they get in that genre because you know it the the iceberg we see is rock star and oh you know, you know mark Knopfler, money for nothing yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah well so, you, you know i get that he's being tongue-in-cheek but the reality is you don't you see all the performance not the rehearsal you you didn't you saw the end product and that is built upon those many 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 hours that's where i forget i wish i could remember the name of the guy but the ten thousand hours guy 
really was on to something that it takes there's no shortcuts and every time that you take a shortcut it will potentially be a problem later on right if you don't work the process so have you seen steve vai's monster guitar that he he got done what was that the six neck one yeah yeah or the three neck the three neck i think he's I got mean, one where he's got three on each side oh no he's got the three neck he just played it somebody recorded it and put it on youtube he played it live did not turn off my ringer my apologies to everybody out there that's okay yeah getting back to that that segment you were talking about street hockey because <laughs> i i want to ask you a question but i'll refer to it in this way so um your jokes like can you sell can you sell the same joke in canada and does it work as well in the u.s the reason i ask that hold that thought Okay. It's because I saw an interview with Mike Myers okay. when Wayne's World came out, and he so he went to the premiere in L.A. All right. And he said the 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 hockey scene and got a few chuckles, but when he came over to Toronto and did the premiere here, he said that got the biggest. It went, it went crazy. Yeah. Yeah. He said they just blew the roof off. Oh so, yeah. No. Chicago, this, Detroit, Minneapolis, probably Los yeah. Angeles, New Mexico. New. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's funny because uh, uh, I've, I've never really had um, a big problem uh, in America uh, because I went to university there. That's where I went to play football in a, a really tiny uh, college in southern Iowa. Oh, okay. Um, so I lived amongst the Americans uh, and I speak American. Uh, <laughs> I am American. So I, uh, so I, um, it wasn't particularly hard for me because, again, I, I'd lived as a college student going, oh, I need, I want to get some Smarties. And then what the hell are those? Or like, you know, the, the, the minor cultural differences. Right. And then sort of, uh, you know, you hang out with people from Saskatchewan and they say bunny hug and you look at them weird, which is a hoodie, if you don't know. Um, it's like that's a crazy name for a hoodie. But however we got there, that's what that is. Um, so, uh, like I, I, uh, I have a big joke about Canadian tire and it just became home Depot or, uh, Ace hardware or just oh, okay. the hardware store. Right. Right. Because it, it's, it's, you know, again, this is a little bit of how the sausage are made. I almost always have some sort of underlying theme to whatever thing I'm talking about. Like the, the, the peanut allergy joke uh was about uh, uh, banning uh peanuts in the daycare that my daughter was going to right and it i thought i thought that was okay but then they suggested that we didn't keep peanuts in our home and uh so that they couldn't have them before they went to school and i thought that was an overreach so in my mind that joke was more about making your personal problem society's problem right right like this, this i'm empathetic but this isn't the solution that is best for everyone if your child has a, a disability that requires her to or them to use a wheelchair when they come to my house i will help you get them into my house but i don't think it's necessarily for me to build a ramp right. at my house because it becomes an unnecessary component of that we get two strong people help you lift the kid in if, it, if they're coming to my kid's birthday party they're always welcome there's always whatever yeah. but it just doesn't necessitate me putting a ramp on the front of my house yeah right like we'll make accommodations we'll do what we can but I, I to me that joke was about exceeding the authority because you have a problem with something um so almost all the stuff that i do it always has something to do with that and the street hockey thing was was in the same vein it was someone exceeding their authority i don't have a problem with people living their lives yeah. i have a problem when somebody comes and tells me how i can live my life or what i have to do because something's upset them i uh you know this seems to be the big topic in comedy these days because i get this all the time it's like well you can't say anything anymore and it's like well you know you can pretty much still say anything you want you just have to live with the consequences and uh, what I learned from from 
comedians like George Carlin and and Bill Hicks, or, you know, for everybody's heroes, is that have a point, have something right. to say on the topic. Right. You can't just go, this is awful and I hate it. You go, this is awful. On to the next. Like, like you, you can say anything you want. Like I, there's some, there was a, a, a big controversy in one of the Calgary um, open mic rooms a couple of years back where somebody's like, if you do any jokes with the word rape in them, you will never play my, my room again. Right. And I like, and, and, and as a, as a, as a free speech person, I'm like, well, that's a little, that's, that seems excessive. That doesn't seem to be the best way to handle this. Um, but I know why, what you're going for. You can talk about anything, but you better be prepared for people to get upset and you better pre be prepared to have a defendable point. And for me, um, I don't talk about things on stage to piss people off on purpose. I don't try and get a reaction. I try and bring my sensibilities to whatever the topic is. I find this ridiculous, for example, and go, well, this is why I think this is ridiculous. You don't have to agree with me, but this is just my point of view. And I think if you handle them with, you just can't be an asshole anymore. You just can't be me. You know, you can't just go out and, and mock someone for being something they can't control. You know, their color, their race, their, their whatever. Right. Um, the the non-changeable parts of aspects of our personality seems to be for me personally something that's just not worth the time and energy and even jerry seidfeld a couple of years ago in an interview said i don't talk about pedophilia because i don't like thinking about that subject right so yeah. you read all the pedophile jokes you want i don't like getting into that mindset i don't this was jerry speaking i don't like going to the place where i would have to be to in order to understand and to write a joke about that subject and those that do and do well, okay. Um, you know, some of my favorite comedians are the most controversial comedians. I enjoy Chappelle. I enjoy Mark Maron. I like people that have something to say. And then I also am mindful about where I think they've crossed the line or if they've done something to, to be provocative or to do something. Um, but I see them all, for the most part, living with the consequences. What I don't appreciate is people like, um, if you remember, uh, Andrew Dice Clay went on yeah. Arsenio Hall yeah. and cried his eyes out. <clears throat> well, it's just a character and people don't, you know, it's, that's not who I am. It's like, you just played seven nights at Madison Square Garden and made like an $17 million this week being that person that you're now sitting there denying. And he like, made the adventures of Ford Fairlane as, Which wasn't as bad as people said. <laughs> he's actually a fairly good actor. Well, I mean, he's up on stage. Yeah. Oh no, but 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 he was an actor that that turned to comedy to further yeah. his acting career. Yeah. Um. And and again, it's 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 it, if you feel the need to apologize for a piece of material, up, above and beyond the um the I'm I I was unaware that that was upsetting to people like like pure blissful ignorance is is a reasonable defense um but the like uh, i just I, it, going if you have feel the need to go on to to social media or do something and apologize for a piece of material you did like i'm sorry i i know what i'm doing on stage and if you don't know what you're doing on stage then maybe you shouldn't be there right. that's just me um, but I know when I'm, when I'm provoking people, I don't, I try not to do this because I'm, I don't, I, over the years, I've stopped wanting to have those awkward conversations in the back of the room. Um, oh, for the most, I mean, it depends. Yeah. Like, you know, I go through phases <laughs> where you know, I'll get pretty riled up about something and I'll talk about it. And if, and if well, it, did you get any feedback? Cause I watched some of your old footage, like within the past week before we started talking today yeah. and you there was one segment in your just for laughs or maybe it was comedy now it was comedy where now you, where you were talking about the um the tree the clear cutting and yeah. you're like okay people hello this is how it works <laughs> yeah. cut the trees down and then they plant more trees 
and that's then how it wait. works. Did you get any? Did you get any flack about that one? Uh, no, that one. That one didn't register okay. at all. Yeah, I mean, people like I, 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 people who enjoy stuff very rarely let you know. Other than like, I watched your special and it was great. People that don't like your stuff are really vocal about it. That seems like to be with Chappelle's got like Chappelle's got about the the whole transgender yeah. thing. Which I don't understand. Like it's that's that's a that's a that's a uh, a topic that that I don't feel the need other than to, than to I, I have a few things where I talk about um, different subjects where uh, like I talk about the RCMP hiring policy and it's right. it, and it's about I don't care I don't care about your race your religion your color like if you can stop a criminal from doing criminal shit then yeah. you can be a cop yeah. Like that's my criteria: your height, your weight, your 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 gender, or your sexual preference is secondary to can you function as a police officer? Exactly. And do the the role of the police officer in society. If you can meet exactly. that criteria, because I think on that special I did a, thing, a similar bit about firemen. Like I don't yep. care. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah, you need to be able to run into a burning building. And I think I was 230 pounds at the time. So drag 230 pounds or, you know, me out of a building, then here's your hat. Here's your Dalmatian. You can ring the fire bell. Like, I don't <laughs> care. Like, it just, it, it, the, the gender issue is a gender issue on its own. But I, 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 I'm also a big fan of the idea of, of sometimes common sense needs to be part of the equation, which is sensitivity is a wonderful thing and, and political correctness and, and being more empathetic to people that live around us. Uh, but I'm not going to tell a five foot one kid that he can make the NBA with any level of confidence. There's criteria to being a professional basketball table player. And it is, you need to be at a, a functioning height of the other people that you're playing or be so exceptional like steve nash yeah well he was still six three or whatever yeah but like he was still. a short basketball player but he was remarkably talented yeah right and there's there's an and that's part of you know the, <laughs> this is part of being middle-aged as you sit around and you go you know uh i think i think it was uh for people anybody that's watching this outside of vancouver is i would have been the same draft class as trevor linden and this is this is a true story. I never really, I never, I, I switched from hockey to football when I was like twelve. Uh, so I, I and I was never that great of a hockey player. But until he retired, there was always like, you know, maybe I'll get in shape and try out for the NHL. Like the dream kind of lived until Trevor Linden retired, <laughs> because I was like, okay, I'm done. But it would, it, I, I think that that we should encourage people to follow their dreams and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we should have realistic expectations. For sure. um, yeah. So if you, if there's something about, because we, we talk about equality a lot. My wife and I have been talking about this a lot in the last little while is that uh, everybody is not created equal. Every, we are all individuals. We were talking about um, some of the things that JK Rowling has talked about, about, about trans women specifically and one of her cases is well how can she understand what it's like to be a woman and i was like maybe you should slow your roll because i don't is 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 that the only criteria we measure people by like how do you know what it's like to be a woman that my 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 daughters and my wife have different experiences of being a woman right it's a it's a it's an amalgamation and i think that we've spent too, way too much time on these what it's like what 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 constitutes being a man i'm like well i don't know spend much time thinking about it I, I i spend more of my time being a me and more of my time being a tim yeah and i i'm bad at math and good at comedy and not so good at guitar i'm a pretty great dad but i also don't eat that great like <laughs> we all every component of our personalities seem to be double-edged swords right. sometimes this works out great being a little maniac being a little adhd being a little hyper focused on things when i was when i need to write jokes that's a wonderful skill set when i need to get stuff down around the house 
not so great. <laughs> like, we all work with what we got. And, and, yeah. and I think what it's, it's incumbent on us all as individuals is to figure out where our ceiling is. What can we accomplish? And there's a great article by uh, Kirk Vonnegut where he talked about when he was 15 years old going to an archaeological dig. And the archaeologist, he was having fun. He was digging up like pieces of pottery and stuff. And, and Vonnegut turned to the guy that was helping him. And he said, well, you know, I don't know if I could do this for a living. He says, you don't have to. He was like, what? He says, you could just come out and dig for fun. You can do something that you can, that you're good at, that you make money at, but you can also just come and help us dig stuff up every once in a while. If you kind of, if you feel like doing it and you enjoy it, you don't have to make your, your passions, your occupations. Right. You can be bad at something and still enjoy it go to any wedding there's lots of people out there dancing their faces off that have no business dancing but who am i to tell them that they can't have fun doing their bad dance right. are they gonna, are they going to make a broadway play or or join river dance probably not but does that mean they're not having fun at ben and jill's wedding no why why rain on anybody else's parade too yeah. that's part of it yeah just let people be people well, I, th but that's we've gotten into this weird tribal thing where everybody's yeah. got to pick a team. Yeah, right. Are you a Republican or Democrat? How about a person? How about if that's a good idea, I'll vote for that. And if that's a good idea, I'll vote for that. If that guy seems like a feckless twat waffle, maybe I won't vote for him. Yeah, but it's like this with politics. It's like oh, it just battering well, ram. It is. It's just, you know like vaccines, whatever. Everybody's just picking sides, and it's yeah. like well. You know what? Maybe just take a step back. Maybe we don't this ride or die mentality. Like I'm, like the the whole Trump versus Hunter Biden stuff in America. Just newsflash, all you weird Republican people. If Hunter Biden did a crime, investigate it, charge him, take him to trial. If twelve people say he's guilty, put him in prison. Yeah. You know, I don't care who the kid he is. Like, it, that's, that's how the justice system is supposed to work. Yeah. You know, I'm not defending anything he's done. I'm just saying, like, it's just, like, investigate him. Check it out. If there's something to charge him with, I'm cool with you charging him. Yeah. I'm not going to defend him if he's done something illegal. Yeah. It shouldn't be, a, a, you know, and again, like, so what? Like, he's not the president. He's the president's kid. Like, <laughs> You're old enough to remember. Remember Carter's brother, Billy Carter? Yeah. Yeah. He's selling it's beer. Up farm? Yeah. <laughs> he was a, can you imagine if that guy had been around in the, in the age of social media? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they would have hung him out to dry. Well, they kind of, they, they, they railroaded Carter anyway, but. Yeah, they did. <laughs> I'm putting solar panels on the, on the White House. <laughs> well, you're a communist, clearly. Um, <laughs> off with you. Get out of my house. Yeah, and again, but that, yeah, but but stop thinking about the, these. Uh, for me personally, like I said, I think we'd all be a little bit better off if we started stop treating people like groups. Right. No, and, I and agree. There needs to be some sort of adversity. Like, like we talked about it a little earlier. Come, you do. You live your life. If you ain't hurting anybody, I don't give a damn. Doesn't you know? Maybe not do it on my property. If you're, if it's next door, keep the volume down after 11, like whatever, like it doesn't really yeah. make any difference. I have a problem with people telling me how I'm going to, I need to live my life. That's where it stops yeah. with me. Right. So I'm not here to condemn or to, to chastise anybody for anything too severe. Just, you know, I'm not doing that. <laughs> how have you found, how have you found comedy? changed over the decades it's like is it because <coughs> like you did the peanut allergy joke but is it more is it more difficult like do you find you have to fine tune things before you go out on stage or is um it, is it I, harder for you to write jokes now hopefully you've gotten a bit of a sense of, of of how i sort of try and conduct myself in the real world like the the the, the precepts that we're talking about about it's more about the process and the outcome yeah. And that I'm I'm more concerned about speaking to people as individuals rather than a group. 
Um, I have a joke in my act where it's just like, as far as I know, I'm not prejudiced, but I haven't met all the groups. <laughs> I'm being open-minded about being closed-minded sometime in the future. <laughs> Um, but what it is, is that I, be I believe that, that disliking people or even, God forbid, hating people is a natural human response. But I think it needs to be based on their character and activity and not one of the things that they can't control. Right. Like if I meet somebody from just pulling the name of, look, from Pakistan, who's a jerk to me. I'm not mad at people from Pakistan. I'm mad at that jerk. Yeah, because I don't like jerks. If I'm prejudiced as a group of people, it's jerky ass people, right? right? And I don't care what flavor of jerk they are. <laughs> <laughs> if you're being a jerk, I don't like you that much. But jerk. it's it it ends in my mind when they're out of my range. Like you know, if I'm sitting next to somebody who's being loud and obnoxious, and I ask the waitress if I can move to another table. I don't feel the need to go back and tell that guy to shut up. I don't feel the need to tell that guy how to live his life. I, it wasn't worth the effort for me. It's easier for me to just move tables or leave the restaurant than to have those kind of confrontations because yeah. honestly, I believe it's my bag to carry. If I don't like your behavior, I have no earthly right to ask you to change it unless I voted for you. And then maybe a little bit. <laughs> How long does it, like, let's say you, we kind of touched on the subject prior to this, but okay. you have some, you have some gigs coming up. Oh, how long, yeah. We're, how we're, long does it take you to get a show together? Does it depend on how long of a set you have? And um, It should matter. <laughs> <laughs> The way that I've always approached, well, not always approached it, but probably the last 10 years or so, um, I do have a, a, a very grand luxury of being a, a, a fairly prolific uh, participant in this industry for the better part of 30 years. So I have, a, I have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of eight or nine hours worth of jokes that I can draw from. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Funny thing happened. I uh, uh, there was a, a a show here in town, and uh, the headliner uh, tested positive for COVID two hours before the show. Oh no! And I had done this show as part of the Okanagan Comedy Festival maybe four months before. And as I'm walking, they they brought me in to replace this guy. Um, like I got a panic call from the booker. Hey, can you come to the the golf club and and do the show? so-and-so is not is, is sick and as i'm walking on stage like as i'm walking on stage uh a couple in the at one of the front tables goes oh we saw this guy last time he was so funny and i needed to take a second and go what did i do last time <laughs> so all i did was i dropped a gear and just opened up some stuff from the back catalog i went okay they saw this joke where I did the joke about the, my doctor and this joke about getting a speeding ticket and this joke and this right. joke and this joke is probably what I, um, so to answer your question directly, uh, I think of a set as like a blueprint of a house. This is kind of what I want to do, right? These are the right. things, but as you know, if you've ever built anything, when, the difference between the blueprint and the actual house you, you actually have to build it and you have to make accommodations <laughs> for all sorts of different uh, random things. So I, I, I never, I don't follow a script, but what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll put a couple of things together. Like, okay, I, and, and I, it, this is another luxury. of Most of my jokes are, are sort of mashed together into 15, 20, 30 minute chunks. Um, I, 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 I sort of got a little famous doing a thing about buying a toilet plunger and going to Canadian Tire to replace it. And at one point, uh, I did that entire segment because I used to drop stuff out. It ended up being almost 40 minutes on one subject. Oh, so I've, I've always, because, and, and the great comedian from Vancouver, uh, or Saskatchewan slash Vancouver, uh, Brent Butt, 
Yeah. I was I was working with him one time and he said it's so much easier to make a joke longer than it is to come up with a whole new premise. And I, I kind of overindulged that thought process where I'll take a, a one liner um, like that plunger joke started with. I We just moved into a new house. My wife called me. I was doing a show at Brock University and I was driving through St. Catharines and she's like, I plugged up the toilet and I can't find the plunger. And I said, well, there's a Zellers up here. I'll just pull in and grab a plunger before my show because I knew it was going to be closed after. Right. And true story, the woman at the till looked at me, looked at the plunger and said, how are we today? And I thought it was the most funniest thing <laughs> because clearly you're not paying attention to what people are buying. I don't know if that's whatever, but I would defy someone with buying a plunger to be in a good mood with that with that that there is a room in that person's house that has an issue that they have to deal with and it's a gross horrible chore these people are not fine <laughs> ever right and i and i thought it was interesting because i remember we were talking about themes is the, the theme of that was the lack of empathy that you get from people who work in these repetitive jobs Right. where they learn their sales pitch and their and their customer service pattern and it sometimes is incongruous with what people are actually buying right and it and it and, it, and part of it was like i said from a thematic point of view was the indifference we have with each other in these forced social moments right um so it became that sort of thing but that it started that night at the university i went i had popped in to buy a plunger and she's like how are we today i'm like well nancy drew let's review the clues like <laughs> and that was the whole joke and when i finally recorded it it was 38 and a half minutes oh my <laughs> so uh it's when it comes to to dealing with 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 sort of like the sensibilities and what you can and can't say like i said i try to relate as much of this uh, the the fountain the, or the well that i draw most of my material from is uh the what i see and hear and think in real life for the most part um there's there's an element of truth um i forget who said it but you never let the truth interfere with a good story right <laughs> uh i've a, i have a joke on my on my last album uh about getting pulled over by a short policeman yes <laughs> yeah okay so <laughs> and you thought he would get bigger as he got closer yeah, to the oh uh, yeah <laughs> it, it's it, it, it and again we're, we're going through how the sausage is made here right about 80 percent of that is a hundred percent true right. and about 20 percent of that is I was thinking it and I didn't actually say it because this is actually a police officer. I have enough respect for, for police officers that I wouldn't call him a micronaut or, or make some sort of overt right. joke at his yeah. expense because uh, they're an authority figure that can impound my vehicle. Yes. Now the, the other part that I don't mention is how much of an asshole he was right. because I was pulled over for doing 93 in a 90 zone. And I legit thought I had a taillight or something because I I, I, I set the cruise control, which what I thought was like, you know, you 90 and, and, and one more press of the plus. You kind of alluded to it, though, just in your tone. Just <laughs> you're talking yeah, about the and, he was just, and he was in, in and, and, and I, I, I tend to separate things into binary things to help me process them. And I honestly believe that there are two distinct versions of police officers, which are people who believe what it actually says on the side of their car to serve and protect. And there are people, yeah. and I used to play softball in Toronto with a group of, of, of police officers that I just sort of fell in with through a trivia night that I was hosting once upon a time. Um, and they're, they're, they were great guys, but they weren't like, you know, and then there's people who uh, have a, a proclivity for that sort of authoritarian boss and people around. Right. And as a six foot two fairly big guy believe it or not i've had some issues with some of the shorter gentlemen amongst us and, and some of their attitude problems 
it's it's uh, there's something the, the, I, I found that a tiny policeman and a, a bit of a chip on his shoulder went very badly with my afternoon that day. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so like yeah, and, he, and his response to it because I was like I don't know like ninety one ninety two he's like you were going ninety three and I was like, and why am I stopping for ninety three in a ninety zone? And he legitimately said the law is the law. You don't get to decide how fast you go. The speed limit says ninety. You need to be doing ninety. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna make you famous. Like this is gonna be a thing. Like this is it. And, and, and again, that's the, the theme of that particular joke, from my point of view, is uh, it's an abuse of authority. Right. Yeah. You, you were not uh, doing the spirit of this thing. You were the letter of the law. Like, there was very, nothing overtly criminal, criminal about me doing 93. Like, if I'm doing 160 through Lake Louise throw thy book at me right Right? like i get it that's dangerous that's reckless 93 like maybe my speedometer's off like every every other policeman i've ever talked to yeah haven't you ever seen planes trains and automobiles yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't even put down my coffee if you weren't doing 110 like (laughs) how many guys were going faster than you i was getting i was you know but but this is part of the process too because going back and forth across the Rockies, I'll do three or four times a month when I'm when I'm busy. Right. Like like three or like in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be going across the Rockies like every weekend between November and Christmas. Oh wow! That's like it's going to be like seven trips, like both ways. So that's fourteen times across this highway. I've done this a hundred times. There's a police officer behind every overpass between lake louise and Banff. right i know i've, I've gotten like regular tickets there <laughs> you just I get out and they go oh, hi mr I know, <laughs> I know i when i'm when i'm when i'm budgeting out my logistics i often go okay i need to be doing less than 100 for the two hours and change it takes to get from golden to Banff. right because it's not worth the risk because there are so many police officers here. So I know, I know the rules. Like I, it's the game we play. So it comes to that. I, I do have to get going fairly quick here. So yeah, just to wrap up, um, okay, you, you said, you said that you got shows coming up. What do you got? Have you got anything that's going to come our way into the Vancouver area at all? Oh, uh, we're working on it. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, the great comedy club, the comedy mix, uh, closed its doors pre-covid yes and uh i no longer work for the yuck yucks organization uh oh. their choice not mine um really yeah well they're lost. It's, a, it's 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 not for public dissemination uh okay. we had a difference of opinion and my opinion was i will work elsewhere um that's as uh, I, although internally grateful for the yuck yucks organization for paying me to learn how to do this um I we hit an impasse and we went our separate ways. All right. Um, I'm working on a few things. Uh, uh, I, I'm weirdly enough, my daughter is going to the University of Saskatchewan, so I've been kind of angling almost every booker in the world <laughs> to find me stuff in and about where she is because I miss her terribly. I'm still getting used to the half-empty nest here. So, uh, uh, yeah, so so this weekend uh, I'm in Red Deer, which I believe is sold out, and we have a big show in Leduc, uh, which if people want to go to my Facebook or my webpage or whatever, find it. Uh, That's the McNair Center, uh, Saturday, October the 8th, and uh, there's still a couple of seats left for that one. So we're going to film it, so uh, don't let it stop you from getting a ticket if you're out there in Leduc land. Uh, but uh, we're not sure what we're going to do with the footage. I don't think it's going to be good enough for a special, uh, but I probably will be parsing it out in the social media and and letting people see what I've been up to for the last couple of years. Nice. Yeah. And then we're getting into Christmas and corporate party season. So a lot of uh, oil companies and, and, and auto body shops and that sort of thing, which is the sort of the harvest season of the Canadian comedians pantheon. <laughs> 
you know, I make more money in November and December than I do for the rest of the year, but uh, it's kind of not always the most uh, artistically stimulating. There's a lot of, you got to color within a lot of lines. <laughs> make sure you don't upset the person who's got your paycheck. Well, and I think, I think Canadian comedians, you know, they deserve a lot more respect than they seem to get. But, you know, the funny thing is, is because a lot of them go down across the border, you know, like Jim Carrey's, the Martin Shorts, John Carrey's. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I saw Martin Short on David Letterman, and, and Letterman asked him, he said, how come comedians are so, or how does it come Canadians are so damn funny? He goes, because we're forced to watch American television. <laughs> Well, I, I've always believed that we're somewhere because uh, I think my sensibilities uh, were as equally influenced by the British. Mm. I, I, I think that uh, I'm of the generation uh, where the Monty Python was on the PBS station. Yeah. And uh, before and somewhere in between Monty Python and Saturday Night Live is where the Canadian comedic sensibility sits. Oh, okay. We tend to have a little bit more of a drier British sense of humor, a little bit more thoughtful, uh, but we still, we're sort of the weird love child of those two gigantic yeah. ecosystems. So, my fondness has always been for SCTV. Oh yeah. Oh god. I was I was having that moment the other day. I I was reminiscing about uh, I was uh, doing some yard work and I I, I have the stereo going, um, closing the pool down. Right. I have speakers out by the pool so that you can lounge. And I have it connected to a Siri so I can, uh, if a song comes on that I don't like, I can just yell at the stereo and make a change without having to get out of the pool. Uh, I know, like, cry for me, uh, <laughs> poor sad comedian. Oh, there's chocolate on your money. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> First world problems are real. Right. Uh, and it's not me. I, I'm married to a very successful woman, so oh, okay. my wife's riches rule this. Yeah, and Canadian comedians make about the same money as an assistant manager at a Burger King. So don't be getting <laughs> delusions of grandeur from me. Um, but uh, uh, Life's Been Good by Joe Walsh came on. Yes, okay. And I had that weird, I, it's never not comes up, is the fishing musician from SCTV <laughs> was the first time I ever actually heard Joe Walsh play guitar. And I've oh. been a fan because I, I thought he was cool enough. Like the music itself st stood, it was great. Rocky Mountain Way, we all know Joe Walsh's work. Yeah. Um, but the fact that he had the, the, he was cool enough to go, you know, SCTV pitched him this ridiculous thing. Like he's from Jesus, Ohio or someplace. Yeah. You know, come on, our, it's, a, it's a show about a fake TV show, station, and you're going to be at a fishing cabin. You, 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 you play songs and fish. Yep. And instead of going, like, you got to be kidding me. He was like, yep, <laughs> I'm in. Let's do that. So I thought his, his street cred went up remarkably. But that's that's how I know Joe Walsh is from. And, uh, and uh, at the festival uh, this year, I'm on part of the Okanagan Comedy Festival. We finally had a chance to bring a uh, guy I started with, uh, Chuck Byrne, out to the festival this year. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and we we were amateurs together in Vancouver. And uh, I, I, we probably spent a good hour reminiscing about Eddie with the guy, the snake on his face, and uh, the time that, uh, that Joe Flaherty uh, uh, tricked a booker friend of mine out of a carton of cigarettes that he was going to pay for later because he only had American money on him. <laughs> But we were having, uh, yeah, SCTV is uh, it's oh, no. oh, infinitely superior. Like, it wouldn't have been yeah. fun to see some of the Saturday Night Live cast on SCTV. That yeah, would have been we fun. were trained in Second City, a yeah. lot of them. Like, yeah, Aykroyd and Bill Murray, Gilda Radner. Yep. They were all trained in the Second well, City. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's that, it's the it's very fertile ground over there yeah. in, in Chicago and then yeah. Toronto, of course. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, well I've, I've it, thoroughly enjoyed this. This has been a, a lot of fun. I hope this has been what you were looking for. More than I expected, good sir. We're at the two-hour mark. Okay. I don't think my conversations have ever gone this long. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, no, okay. I kind of like the sound of my own voice, so that's good. No, you you got a fan here, you lifelong fan for me, you know. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, I, I've, I've never seen you live, but I I got to see Rick Dukeman before he passed. Oh, yeah, no, he and was, he was he was one of my favorites. Yeah, no, I remember him from Almost Live and a few other things, and the video show that he did. He did um, he did that zigzag with. Terry Devon Mulligan. It was shot out of Calgary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. No I problem. appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll send it your way once it's up and ready to circulate. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.